It's a pleasure to be here today, uh, and, and I'd like to thank the Royal Society of Victoria for inviting me to come and talk about what I think is, a, is an important issue around the role of climate change and how it might impact our native forest estate. Um, before I start my talk, however, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, uh, the Wurundjeri, where I live and work, and also the traditional owners of the many other lands that I have worked on over the course of my career in places uh, all over the world. Uh, as someone who has worked in what we typically think of as remote and wild and pristine forests, I recognize that, that many of these landscapes have had a, a human presence for, uh, for centuries or, or millennia, and that, those, uh, that the role of, of those uh, traditional owners as custodians of, of these landscapes has been important in shaping them. So it's with deep respect that I acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands uh, and the communities and their leaders uh, from the past in the present and of the future. Australia is a cultural landscape. There have been people here for tens of millennia and the traditional owners of, of these lands and landscapes have shaped them. They are custodians in every sense of that word. They have worked in, they have lived on these landscapes and have had impacts on them. In some landscapes, probably less impact. In other landscapes, probably more impacts. Uh, the notion, however, that uh, these areas are pristine, untouched by humans, that if we just leave them, they will return to some idyllic state, I think um, ignores the very rich tradition of, uh, of the traditional owners here on this continent. And I think we've seen this all over the world. We've seen it in the uh, Brazilian Amazon. We've seen it in Central and South America. We've seen it in, in parts of North America. There is a long history of human involvement in landscapes. I think we need to acknowledge it, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from it. So today, I'd like to talk about uh, how climate is going to impact our forests and what we might be able to do about that. So if you're watching from home and have been zoomed out for most of the last year and a half, I'm gonna give you the takeaway message for my talk in the next three slides. If you want to cut the Zoom feed after that and go take a nap, you're welcome to do that. You will have the main message. If you'd like to stick around and watch the longer version, you're also very much welcome to do that. So the main message of my talk is that climate change is impacting our forests, that forest management can buffer these impacts, but not forest management as we know it. And I want to unpack this. I'm going to talk about this in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about climate change and, and how we know climate change is happening. In the second part, I'm going to talk about how the forests are being impacted. And in the third part, I'm going to talk about how forest management might be able to help with this. So the first part of the talk is around climate change and describing how it's happening. Now, if you're interested in this, I'm not going to talk at great length about it. David Crowley gave a, a very good talk last August in, for the Royal Society. So if you go to the Royal Society's YouTube uh, page, you can listen to his talk and, and he gives a, a really detailed uh, discussion of climate change. And uh, I would recommend you have a look at that. So this is a picture that many of you will have seen in one form or another. This is annual mean temperature anomalies in Southeastern Australia. And as you can see, over the course of the past century, temperatures have been increasing over time. And many of you will have seen this image or uh, versions of it for Australia or for the world. A more, I think, concerning image is this one. This is the global ocean heat content in the top two kilometers of the oceans of the world. And what you can see here is that since the early 1980s, the amount of heat in the ocean has been increasing steadily, and that heat is effectively the future warming in the world. That over time, even if we were to stop emissions today, that there is an enormous amount of heat that is banked up in the ocean. And as a consequence, warming of the earth is effectively baked in for decades to come, if not longer. Now, my research group works on understanding uh, historical climate variability. We use tree rings to do this. And one of the things that we have done in recent years is develop what's known as the Australian New Zealand Drought Atlas. So we've used tree ring chronologies from around Australia. So the red dots in the image here, so Tasmania, New Zealand, the Northern Territory, Western Australia, and parts of Indonesia to develop a very high resolution spatial grid of drought variability 
that goes back about 500 years. This is my colleague, Jonathan Palmer, in the bottom left with a chainsaw cutting a subfossil log out of a swamp on the west coast of the South Island of, of New Zealand. And he led this project from the University of New South Wales. So this is just some examples of the Australia New Zealand Drought Atlas, the ANSDA, showing the spatial and temporal complexity of droughts in Australia. And so these are just three years uh, when we have, uh, for which we've reconstructed the drought. And you can see how complex they are uh, spatially. This image here is the average drought index. We use the Palmer Drought Severity Index for southeastern Australia. So that is effectively New South Wales and Victoria. The black line is the average value for PDSI over that region. And I'll draw your attention to the two dashed lines. The bottom dashed line is the average PDSI value for the period 2003 to 2009. So that is the tail end of the millennium drought. The upper dashed line is the PDSI value for 2011. And you'll notice the 2011 PDSI value was the wettest PDSI value for the last 500 years as shown in this reconstruction. What's a little bit concerning is that the PDSI values for the millennium droughts are not particularly uh, abnormal given the 500 year record. That you see, if you follow that dashed line back in time, you see a lot of other periods in time when we had similar droughts uh, in terms of intensity. What I wanna draw your attention to is the drought here right in the early 1500s, which is the worst drought in the 500 year record. Okay, and that is worse than any drought that we have seen in modern history. Now, this figure is the most complicated figure I'm gonna show you in the talk. And so I'm gonna take a little bit of time to walk you through it. So this figure shows what we expect droughts are gonna look like in the future. So these are cumulative probability distributions of different climates. The x-axis of this figure is Palmer Drought Severity Index. So zero is the average positive values are wet, negative values are dry. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative uh, probability and that goes from zero to one. There are two dashed lines, vertical dashed lines, one at here at minus one, and that is the average PDSI values during the tail end of the millennium drought. And then the solid orange line is the average PDSI values for that extreme drought in the early 1500s that I just mentioned. Now we've got four curvy lines here. The first one is the ANSDA, the green line, and that is the average of the PDSI values over time. And the second one, which is very similar, is the CMIP-5. So this is the climate model inner comparison project for the period 1901 to 2000, so the 20th century drought conditions. And you'll see that they start here around minus two, they cross this line, the dashed orange line, at about 0.5. So that means the conditions that we saw during the millennium drought roughly happen 5% of the time over that century period or over the longer period of the ANSTA. And that the drought conditions, so that is to say left of zero, happen roughly 50% of the time, and wet conditions happen the other 50% of the time. The next line I want to bring to your attention is the red dashed line. That's CMIP-5 for the period 2020, so from now forward for the next 30 years. And you'll notice it's shifted to the left. And what that means is the models suggest we'll be getting more intense droughts. So the drought of the early 1500s, those conditions will happen roughly 5% of the time. And the drought of equivalent to the millennium drought will happen something like 25% of the time. And it crosses zero at about 70%. So drought conditions will be roughly happening 70% of the time and wet conditions the other 30% of the time. And that's obviously a concern. What's a real worry and why I think this is, is, is really a scary figure is this solid red line, which is the CMIP projections for 2050 to the end of the 21st century. And you'll notice that we are seeing PDSI conditions that we have never seen in the last 500 years that the worst drought of the past 500 years, those conditions are likely to happen roughly 25% of the time, that the millennium drought is going to be something that happens around half of the time, and the drought conditions in general will be typical for 80% of years. Wet conditions will be relatively rare. And that's a real, real concern. So why does this matter? There's a couple of things. First, warming is relentless. That ocean heat content is going to be released eventually and it will continue to warm the world. And so the warming is baked into the system and it's something we need to think about dealing with for a long time into the future. Second, it's important to recognize that we have had bad droughts in the past. 
and that the vegetation, the flora, the fauna of southeastern Australia have weathered those. Third, the climate model predictions suggest that in the near term, we're going to have worse droughts, things that are similar to what we might have had uh, in the early 1500s, for example. And finally, the longer range climate model predictions suggest we're going to have much worse droughts in the long term. And that will have profound consequences for our forests. I think it's really important to recognize that Australia, southeastern Australia in particular, is probably at the forefront of the world in bearing the brunt of climate change in the native forest estate. And we're probably at the back of the pack in the world in terms of doing the research for how we should manage our forests. And so I think uh, really thinking about how we invest in research that focuses on adapting our management to climate change is long overdue and is fundamentally important if uh, we want to move forward in a constructive way. So that brings me to the second part of my talk. How are forests impacted by climate change? So there's a couple of different ways that this happens, and I'm going to talk about uh, two or three. The first one is climate as a disturbance itself. So typically we think of disturbances as fires or cyclones or logging. In the last uh, decade or two, we've begun to recognize that climate itself can be a disturbance. And the most obvious version of this is drought. So this is a picture from Mudgee in New South Wales in uh, 2019 when we we're having you know, extremely dry conditions. And what you see here is widespread dieback of eucalypts across an entire landscape. So incredibly broad scale mortality. Some trees are surviving, obviously, other trees are not. So there's a lot of spatial variability to this, but there's widespread landscape scale mortality associated with droughts. This is a little bit closer to home here in the Strathbogies. And you can see here, the whole side of this hill is effectively browned off due to the drought conditions that we had in, uh, in 2019 and the drought conditions that preceded it in 2017, 2018. Now I'm gonna make a quick shout out to a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Belinda Medlin at Western Sydney University, who's developed a citizen science tool called the Dead Tree Detective. And this is a website where if you're driving around on family holidays and you see trees that are dying, whether from uh, drought or, or other causes, you can take a picture of it, use the geotag on the photo and upload it to the Dead Tree Detective website. And the URL is here on the bottom of the slide. And it'll go into a, a citizen science database of observations of uh, tree mortality around Australia. So this is an example from the 2019 drought as we we're beginning to see widespread mortality across Southeastern Australia. And these are the dead tree detective records here uh, across, in particular, the eastern part of New South Wales, where there was very widespread mortality associated with the drought conditions you see in the middle there. So if you see dead trees, take a picture and, and upload it to the dead tree detective. The second way we think about climate and how it will impact forests is as a driver of disturbance. And the obvious place that we see this is in fires. Southeastern Australia is a fire prone uh, region and fires have had profound impacts in the past and the present and uh, surely will in the future. This is a photograph taken after the 2019-20 fire season in East Gippsland. Obviously this is taken from a helicopter looking out over a landscape that's been completely pulverized. Uh, it looks like a, an atomic bomb has gone off due to the fires. This is another uh, photograph from the Arunundra National Park. And you can see the trees are beginning to bounce back. There's some of the bigger trees here that have sprouts uh, growing up and down the stems. The tree ferns certainly are coming back. But these fires are intense, they're catastrophic, and they have profound effects on forest composition and forest structure. Now, not all of the fires are completely catastrophic and wipe everything out. There's a lot of spatial variability to these fires. But the impacts are important and they're something that we need to be really grappling with as we go forward in uh, the 21st century. This is a picture uh, from Marysville here in Victoria at Lake Mountain looking out over the landscape and you can still see the signature of the Black Saturday fires from 2009 in the dead trees that are scattered over uh, tens of thousands of hectares in, in these landscapes. Now one of the things that we have found is that the fire regimes themselves are changing. So we've had intense damaging fires but what we're in many ways really concerned about is that the frequency or the intensity of the fires may have changed. So this is some work that my colleague Scott Mooney from UNSW and I have done in Kosciuszko National Park. And we looked at sediment cores from bogs and the presence of macro charcoal in them. So macro charcoal we use because it indicates high intensity fires that are putting, uh, putting pieces of, uh, sort of whole pieces of, of charcoal, charcoalized wood into, into the landscape. 
we had three different sites here and the sediment cores go back in uh, on the left-hand side at Rennox Gap, about 1,000 years. In the middle, Diggers Creek goes back 4,000 years, and Pengilly's Bog on the right hand goes back about 2,000 years. And the key takeaway from this work is that while there has been fire in the past, sort of high-intensity fire in the past, at Pengilly's Bog, for example, we don't see that across the whole landscape. Now, it's important to make the point here that there has certainly been fire in this landscape for a long, long period. The traditional owners are well known to have been uh, managing these landscapes and using fire to manage them. But those fires would have been very different. Low intensity, relatively frequent, not hot enough to be putting charcoal into, into the landscape. The bogs that were selected were selected very specifically because uh, of the properties of, uh, effectively the catchment properties in which they, which they sit. So in order to maximize the, the signal that we would get from charcoal and, and pollen and other things. What we see that really stands out in these uh, sediment cores is that this big spike of charcoal right at the very top of the sediment cores shows that basically since the latter part of the 20th century, there have been lots of big fires and that those are fires that have occurred across the entire landscape. And there is no evidence for anything like that in the past several thousand years of the sediment record uh, in this landscape. So we're really changing the fire regimes uh, comprehensively. Now we've also been able to use tree rings to look at this. So on the left is a picture of a fire scarred snow gum from Kosciuszko National Park and on the right is my colleague Professor Kathy Allen who's now at the University of Tasmania coring one of the basil sprouts from a tree that was killed in a fire. And both of these allow us to date the fires in the more recent history. So the sediment cores have uh, relatively coarse resolution. The tree rings have precise annual dating. So we can actually look at the uh, record of fires in these landscapes. And what we're seeing is areas that have had really no sort of fires that would kill trees for centuries or millennia and are now having one or two or three, in some cases, as many as four or five fires that are killing trees in the last 50 years. And so that's a dramatic change in, in, the, in the base fire regime in these landscapes. So there are many other impacts that climate has on forests and the plants and animals that live in forests. And I don't wanna talk about all of them here. I do wanna just make the point about one other uh, impact, and that is on animals in the forests and how climate may impact them. So this is uh, some work that's recently published by a student in our research group, Ben Wagner, and colleagues uh, at DELP and, and ARI. And it shows the distribution of greater gliders in East Gippsland. And the black points are observations, locations of greater gliders from the 1980s. And the green overlay on East Gippsland is the area that had suitable climatic conditions, where the climate metric here was the number of hot nights. So greater gliders have relatively narrow physiological tolerances for heat. And if the nights become too hot, they can't leave their hollows and forage for foliage, which means that one of the important sources of moisture for them becomes uh, difficult to access. So in the 1980s, the climatic conditions, so, so sort of number of hot nights, was suitable for the greater glider across most of East Gippsland. By the 2000s, that had changed dramatically. And you see not only the retreat of those climatic conditions, the suitable climatic conditions for the greater glider into the very uh, highest elevation sites in East Gippsland, but you see a concomitant withdrawal or retreat of the greater glider populations. And, and they align surprisingly, almost eerily well here. And that's a real concern because it highlights the impact that climate is having on forest dependent species. And that's something we need to bear in mind as we think about forest management. So the third part of my talk, and what I'll spend most of the time on, is how can forest management help? And I'm gonna break that down into two pieces. How we manage stands, so that is sort of the management unit, uh, so sort of the scale of hectares, and how we manage the forest. So when I talk about the forest, we're talking about the whole landscape. In terms of managing the stand, there are three things that are obvious for us to do. We can reduce the density of overcrowded stands, we can grow trees bigger, faster, and we can shift to more fire resistant species. So I wanna start with reducing stand density. This is an important tool in the forest management toolkit, and it's one that has been used elsewhere very successfully. 
We did some early work in the 2000s looking at the impacts of stand density on the response to the millennium drought. So this was work by a PhD student of ours at Monash University, Gillis Werner, who's, who's there on the left. The Forest Commission in the 1960s put in a number of experimental trials, uh, spacing trials, thinning trials uh, around Victoria in, in forests of commercial importance. In this site, this is River Redgum Forest, they did a spacing trial that had trees planted at 600 trees per hectare, which was the lowest density, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, and 8,000 trees per hectare, where 8,000 trees per hectare was the highest density forest. Those plots were measured every couple of years until the late 90s. And then we revisited them in 2007, the end of the millennium drought. And what you see on the left in the high density stand is lots of dead trees on the ground. Most of the trees are pretty small and the crowns aren't terribly vigorous. In contrast, on the right hand side, the low density stand with 600 trees per hectare, the trees are much larger. There's very little dead trees on the ground. There are very few dead trees on the ground and the crowns are, are quite vigorous. So when we look at some of the demographic data associated with this, this is mortality and growth. And I, and I want to focus here on the mortality. In the low density stand, the 600 trees per hectare, this period here is the millennium drought. And effectively, the rate of mortality didn't change over the course of the millennium drought. These low density forests just waltz right through the millennium drought. In contrast, in the high density stand, 8,000 trees per hectare, the millennium drought led to massive mortality. In fact, this led to a five-fold increase in the mortality because these trees are highly crowded. Each individual tree has fewer resources and those resources then, uh, there are fewer resources to devote to root growth, which means that it's harder for the trees because they're smaller to access deeper water sources. As a consequence, we see widespread mortality uh, in the high density stands and uh, very little mortality in the low density stands. And this is not unique to Australia. This, is, uh, this type of work has been replicated all over the world, in particular in North America and Europe. But there's study after study demonstrating that if you want to increase the resilience of forests, you should lower the, uh, to climate change, you should lower the density of the stands. The next thing I'd like to talk about is growing big trees faster. This is really important, particularly in the context of fire and the impacts of fire on forests. So I'm going to start with this figure. So this is a paper published by Taylor et al. Uh, six or seven years ago. And I highlight this figure because I think it's a good example of what I refer to as the time since fire fallacy. What they showed in this study was that this is the age of a stand. So these, they used remote sensing data to look at the impacts of the 2009 bushfires on stands of different age. And on the y-axis, you have the probability that the canopy or the crown of individual trees was consumed in the fire. And as you see, there's a big pulse early on. So there's much higher canopy consumption in younger forests. And they make the point that the period of high risk for these forests is between roughly seven years after a disturbance to about 36 years. And that older forests are much less at risk of loss of, of canopy, the loss of their crowns. The time since fire fallacy here uh, is important because I think this figure and other figures like it, these are, uh, this is not the only one, provide a sort of fatalistic sense for time and forests and climate change. That effectively we just have to wait for 30 or 40 or 50 years and then the forests will be okay. And that there's not much we can do about it other than try to protect the forest from disturbance. In a world in which uh, the climate is warming rapidly in which fires appear to be becoming more frequent. The notion that we can protect forests from fire for half a century, I think, is, um, is ambitious and overly optimistic. So what we need to be thinking about is how do we move trees out of this period of high risk more quickly? So we've been uh, doing some work on understanding the probability of uh, fire-induced mortality. And this builds on work that's been done uh, for decades now and is, is a relationship that's well known. And that is that bigger trees have a higher probability of surviving fire. Okay, so in the wake of the 2009 fire, we did surveys of patterns of mortality across the landscape. And we developed uh, statistical models uh, based on those observations. And this is an example of one here on, uh, on the right for eucalyptus radiata. So this is narrowleaf peppermint. And what I want to make the point about here is that fire mortality or the probability of mortality is related to tree size. So you have diameter on the x-axis, you have the probability of mortality on the y-axis. 
The smallest trees in our survey at five centimeters have 100% probability of mortality under any fire conditions. So these different lines here represent different fire intensities with the reddest being high intensity fire and the palest being low intensity fire. And if we just take one of these lines, so I'll take the second orange line here, you'll notice that as the trees get bigger, the probability of mortality decreases. And so if you are a 40 centimeter tree uh, of Eucalyptus radiata, and you have a fire of this sort of low to moderate intensity, then you have a 50-50 chance of surviving. Okay? If the fire is more intense, then you have a very low chance of surviving. If you want a narrow leaf peppermint to survive a fire or have at least a, a chance of surviving a, a very high intensity fire, the tree needs to be roughly 90 centimeters in diameter. So the bigger the tree, the more likely they are to survive a fire. Why does this matter? This matters because we know that we can have a profound impact on the size of trees through forest management. And the thinning in particular can increase tree growth and reduce uh, fire-induced mortality. So this is data from a thinning trial. And again, this was work that was established by the Forest Commission after the 1939 fires. There was a lot of really forward-looking research that was established a long time ago, and uh, we have been reaping the benefits of that for ages now. On the left, you have a control plot that was unthinned. On the right, you have a plot that was thinned. Two things to notice here. The first one, obviously, is the thin plot has fewer trees, as you would expect in a thin plot. And the second thing is that those trees are much larger. So you have diameter on the x-axis. The average diameter of the thin stand is 105 centimeters. And the average diameter in the unthin stand, the control stand, is 55 centimeters. Okay, so they're almost twice as big in the thin stand. Now, if we simulate a fire using that relationship that I showed you before for the eucalyptus regnans against those tree sizes, what we see is roughly half of the trees in the control site would have been killed. Whereas in the thin site with the much bigger trees, you have very little mortality. Only a couple of the trees in this case died. And so this is a sort of low to moderate uh, intensity fire, which is uh, a large part of the fire footprint in 2009 would have been in that intensity class. And so thinning has a profound effect here in terms of survivorship. The key point that I wanna to make to return to this time since fire fallacy is that these stands are the same age. The only difference between these stands, they're both 1939 regrowth, the only difference between these stands is that the thin stand had the density reduced early on in stand development, which meant that individual trees had more resources to grow with and were able to grow much bigger much quicker. And so that means that they're less likely to die in a fire of equivalent heat that would have wiped out quite a lot of the trees in a denser stand of smaller trees. Now, this is important because we have a landscape that has a lot of very dense forest on it. So these are some data from work that students in our lab have done over the years, where we've looked at how many saplings do you have on disturbed sites. And so we've looked at clear fells on the left and after the 2009 bushfire on the right. The average density of stems in the clear fell sites roughly around five, five and a half thousand trees per hectare. And in the wildfire sites, it's closer to 10 or 12,000 trees per hectare, with some exceptional uh, examples of more than 50,000 trees per hectare. So if you remember the river red gum example I showed, there the density was roughly 8,000 trees per hectare. The trees had very little vigor, they were small, they were falling apart. In these high density mountain ash stands, the trees will grow much more slowly when they're growing at those densities. And that means that they will be exposed to the risk of mortality from fire for a longer period of time. If you reduce the density, they grow faster, they get to fire safe sizes sooner, and the risk of complete loss of a stand is uh, thereby reduced. The third point that I'll make with regards to stand level management is that we can shift to more fire resistant species. So the work that I showed, uh, I showed this figure here for Eucalyptus radiata. We've done this for a number of different eucalypts. And what you see is that there's some very obvious differences in fire resistance amongst species. So if you look at just the eucalypts on the lower panels, Eucalyptus obliqua in effect cannot be killed by fire once it reaches about 40 centimeters in diameter. So at 40 centimeters in diameter, even under the worst conditions in the 2009 bushfire, it had a 50-50 chance of surviving. As you move from left to right, the trees become more sensitive to fire. They're more susceptible to fire-induced mortality. They have to be larger in order to survive the same fire that Eucalyptus obliqua would have survived at a smaller size. The thing about Eucalyptus obliqua is, is, is that it's widely distributed. 
Uh, so it's a component of, of uh, you know, range of different force and force types. And because it is able to withstand fire, that means that, for example, if we think about carbon, when we have a, a fire and the fire kills lots of trees, then that's carbon that will eventually return back to the atmosphere. If the trees survive, then that carbon won't go back to the atmosphere. So the more trees that survive these fires, even if it's a small percentage, you know, if we increase the, um, the fraction of trees that survived the 2019-2020 fire season by a couple of percent, uh, we would have saved incredible amounts of carbon going back into the atmosphere over the coming decades. And so, you know, when we scale up to 20 million hectares of forest burnt, that's, that's a big deal. And so I think the important, uh, the important thing around Eucalyptus obliqua and other more fire tolerant species is that because they'll persist, some of those values, like carbon, like habitat in the wake of fires, will be available uh, and, and able to persist through into the next phase of, of, of the forest as many of the other uh, parts of the forest have to regenerate. So they, because they can survive, they provide islands of habitat, they provide uh, effectively fixed pools of carbon that are still in living, uh, living trees that aren't gonna return to the atmosphere. And so those are very important in terms of uh, ecosystem services that, uh, that having resistance to fire would confer on parts of the landscape. So one of the things in terms of forest management that we need to think about is which species we have where and what sizes are those trees? Because that will effectively act, the fires will act as a filter that goes through and kills trees of certain species and certain sizes based on their ability to withstand the fire. What's interesting about Know the Fagus is if you include the resprouting, it will survive just about anything. That graph, we did not include resprouting because it just makes the graph a little bit more cluttered. And so this is a very important thing to understand is a lot of trees in, uh, in Australia are able to resprout, not all, but uh, a large proportion of them are able to resprout. And that's an important, important component of surviving fires. And so for some of those rainforest species, they're actually quite resilient to fire. And this is something we, uh, we showed in some work in, in the uh, 2000s that the cool temperate rainforest after the 2009 bushfires uh, was actually surprising, surprisingly resilient to fire. Although it's probably worth adding that whether they can absorb multiple fires repeatedly is unclear. And so that's something that we worry about. And uh, for example, in, in the north coast of New South Wales in those rainforests, there's real concerns about frequent repeat fires uh, effectively eroding uh, the, 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 uh, the base of the large trees and removing them from the system. The species that are going to really suffer, and we're already seeing this, are the species that are obligate cedars. So the alpine ash in particular has been absolutely hammered in the Alps, uh, where we have you know, multiple repeat fires within a decade or two that's effectively eliminated. Uh, effectively eliminated the species from uh, parts of the landscape, and that then requires a very, um, a very substantial human uh, uh, response of seeding, uh, seeding the forest if we expect to have that species uh, return into into those landscapes. Thinking carefully about which species and what sizes we have of those trees in the forest and across the landscape is important for trying to. Uh, buffer some of the impacts of fires in these, uh, in these types of stands. Okay, now the last thing I'm gonna talk about is managing the forest. So this is the broader scale perspective. And there's two things I'm gonna touch on. The first is a shift to uneven age forest management. And the second is increasing structural diversity across the landscape. For decades, forest scientists have been talking about, the, uh, about using natural disturbances to guide our silvicultural practices. There's many studies from uh, many parts of the world, including here in Southeastern Australia, that have made this case, that we should take these natural disturbances as a guide or use them as analogs for how we do our forest management. So one of the things, particularly in Southeastern Australia, we should be thinking about is shifting towards uneven aged forests. So much of the forest management that has been done here in Southeastern Australia and in Victoria over the last half century has been even focused on the development of even age stands. And there are a lot of good reasons in terms of operational efficiency, in terms of economic efficiency, in terms of safety, that people have done that. In the face of climate change, there's serious issues with those arguments. So we need to consider a shift towards uneven aged 
forest management. So this is a picture of forest management activities in East Gippsland. And the point I want to make here is that we really haven't changed at all what we do in our forest management in Victoria for a long time. So this is 1965. The forest was cut. The tree species that had no commercial value were left on the ground. They were burned and then the site was sown. This is 2017, also in East Gippsland, and you can see the same thing has happened. The non-commercial trees are left on the ground, the site is burned, and the site was then sown. So we haven't really changed our forest management practices in half a century, and we need to be thinking about doing that. Now, one I think really neat example is this uh, pilot project uh, from a site near uh, Buchan that's led by a sawmill owner and some contractors who wanted to see if they could do forest management in a different way to the, the standard practice uh, of even age forestry. And so this is a site prior to the harvest, okay? And this is the site immediately after the harvest, two months later. And what you'll notice, of course, in stark contrast to the pictures, for example, of clear fells, is that a lot of trees are still here. Right? Most of uh, the trees in the forest actually have been left. So they had some rules about how do we decide which trees to keep and which trees to take. And the basic idea was we would keep habitat trees, we would keep trees that had important other values, and for any tree of potential commercial value, we would ask the question, do we think it has more value if we were to come back in 10 or 15 years? And if we think it does, then, uh, then we'll leave it and come back for it later. This is the forest in uh, three years after the, the harvest. And the thing that really jumps out at me here is this area here where you can see how vigorous those crowns are. The trees that have been left behind have a lot of space to grow in. The crowns are green, they're well-formed, they're big, they're able not only to grow much faster, but they're going to obviously then be able to withstand climatic fluctuations uh, more readily. And then the last picture here is after a fire in 2017 that burnt through this site. Now this, Fire was beginning to, to peter out uh, as it reached this site. But what you'll notice is that it's had very little effect on the forest per se. There's obviously some of the smaller plants have been burned. Uh, there's one tree here, and I'll just back up and show you the tree that disappeared there, one large tree that was lost in the fire. But you see very little crown scorch and uh, very little in terms of impact on forest structure of, of that fire. And this is likely because, amongst other things, Breaking up the forest by taking out groups of trees uh, throughout the, the, the um, management unit breaks up the continuity of the fuels, the canopy fuels in, uh, in, in the site. So there's some benefits to uneven age forest that are worth talking about. The first one, as I said, is it breaks up the canopy fuel, so it reduces the connectivity of those fuels. And so that may have the effect of reducing the severity of fires. It retains large trees, and that's a good thing for lots of different reasons. It's good for habitat, and as I said earlier, it's good because large trees are more likely to survive fires, which means that if we have fires in these forests in the future, there will be more trees that are likely to survive them and provide habitat or resources for animals that uh, also survive the fires. And then finally, when we do less intensive uneven age systems, we go in to harvest trees more frequently, and that means that there are more opportunities for recruitment over time. And so we can begin to look at the possibility of using long range forecasts to plan on when we would do our regeneration harvesting in order to give the regeneration the best chance given climatic conditions. So choose years when we expect them to be relatively cool and moist. There are some challenges to uneven age forestry and it's important to acknowledge those. First of all, if we're in the forest harvesting trees repeatedly, we're opening up the canopy and that's gonna increase temperature and wind at the forest floor. And that will have a drying effect, uh, or at least, at least over the short term, have a drying effect on uh, some of the fine fuels. And so that can have an impact if a fire comes through. The second one is there may be a potential shift in species composition. If we're putting in smaller, less intense disturbances into a site, then it's likely we'll see recruitment of more shade tolerant species. And that might not be a bad thing. I think historically some of the heavy hardwoods, which are relatively shade tolerant, have uh, been heavily reduced and this may be a, of a benefit to them, may not be as good for some of the more shade intolerant species. And so that's something that would have to be monitored over time. And finally, probably the biggest challenge with uneven age forestry is it's complicated. We don't have a lot of experience doing it. We have a few pilot projects that are looking at this, but we don't really have years or decades of experience in implementing it. And so there are many lessons that we still need to learn about how to do this and how to do it well. The other point is it requires a lot of knowledge of these systems. 
So we need to have data on the species composition, on the tree sizes, and so on and so forth. And that's something that we don't really have. The challenge there is really, uh, you know, finding the data uh, that's important and, and thinking about how we use it. Can we ask smart questions and get smart answers using this this remarkable data resources that are now becoming available to us? And also, and, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that there's some things that it can't do. So, for example, identifying species remotely in eucalypt forests is, as far as we can tell, impossible. Um, the eucalypts are just too similar in terms of the spectral signature of their leaves, and that's a problem. And so, where we have mixed species forests, we can identify them as eucalypt forests. We can identify differences in the size of the trees and the structure of the forest, but trying to actually pick the species is difficult. And so ultimately what we need is an integrated program that takes advantage of the strengths of things like remote sensing, but also uh, builds on uh, field-based knowledge. And that's, uh, you know, ultimately that's where we need to go in the future. And we need to do it and we need to keep doing it long-term data sets are incredibly valuable. So the last thing I'll talk about for the stand level management is emulating natural disturbances at the landscape scale and actually doing this in a way that really reflects natural disturbances. And let me explain what I mean by that. So this is the Central Highlands. And again, uh, making the point here that the silvicultural methods that we've used in the Central Highlands for mountain ash forests have really not changed for decades. So in both photographs here, you have clear felling, you then burn the slash, and then uh, you sow seeds later on. We use clear felling, the clear fell burn and sow system, historically because it emulates the conditions after a catastrophic bushfire, which we take as the natural disturbance in these types of forests. The question though is, is that really what catastrophic bushfires look like? And so a PhD student of mine, uh, Katie Hammond, is doing some really neat work using some of the remarkable remote sensing uh, data sets that are becoming available to us to look at what happened after the 2009 bushfire. So what was the fingerprint of the 2009 bushfire on the Central Highlands landscape? And so she uses point clouds from the LIDAR that was commissioned by DELT, the Department of Environment, Land, Water, and Planning, to look at forest structure after the fires. And so we have sites, uh, these are 20 by 20 meter pixel sites that are recognizably full canopy, so not impacted by fire, partial canopy, so they may have been impacted by fire, and uh, no canopy where there clearly used to be forests there, but all of the trees were killed. And then she can go through the landscape and she's developed algorithms to do this and take those point clouds and automatically classify them as being full canopy cover, like the dark green, partial canopy cover, like the, the middle shade of green, and then no canopy cover, like the, the lightest green there. And then she can do this for the entire landscape. And so on the left-hand side, you see a two kilometer by two kilometer tile with 20 by 20, every 20 by 20 meter pixel that has mountain ash forest in it within the 2009 fire footprint. What she then did, was to take the data from this of canopy cover after the 2009 bushfires and ask the question, what would be the silvicultural analog to what we see happening from the fire? So we want to mimic or emulate natural disturbances. So let's see what exactly the natural disturbance did. And so she grouped the 20 by 20 meter pixels into one hectare pixels. And if most of the forest had been killed by the fire, then it was considered an analog for a clear fell. If almost none of the forests have been killed by fire, then it was considered to have not been harvested. And then she had some clumping algorithms if there were intermediate conditions where some of the trees uh, survived, so between I think 20 and 80% of the trees survived, whether those trees were aggregated in clumps or were they relatively dispersed over that hectare. And the image on the right is the, the classification that you see for each of the hectares, the one hectare uh, pixels in that two by two kilometer tile. And the obvious thing you'll notice here is that clear felling in yellow is not the majority, right? Most of what the 2009 bushfire did in this landscape, in this specific tile, was actually not uh, something that looks like a clear fell. It was either something that looks more like dispersed retention or aggregated retention type harvests. So this raises some important questions about how we think about the application of different silvicultural systems across a landscape. And in particular, the notion that we should be moving away from the idea of a single silvicultural prescription or system that is uh, applied across whole landscapes. And we've been able to, again, benefit from work that was established decades ago by the Forest Commission to understand what the impacts of different silvicultural systems are on forest structure and composition.
So this is a picture from the Civil Cultural Systems trial from uh, Tangel Bren that uh, Katie Hammond, my PhD student, is also working on. And there are a suite of different treatments. They include clear fells, they include small gaps, various flavors of retention of the overstory. And Katie and, and our team have been able to go into these stands, measure all of the various structural features of them, and look at exactly 30 years on, what have the different silvicultural systems done in terms of the outcomes for, for forest structure? We can then begin to ask the question, when we look at the 2009 uh, fire and its impacts on the landscape, which of these different silvicultural systems best aligns with different parts of the landscape? And how should we think about balancing those things across the landscape? This is important in the context of climate change because using a single silvicultural system, such as the Clearfell Burn and Sow system, effectively puts all of our eggs into a single basket. By trying many different silvicultural systems across a landscape, which is much more closely aligned with what we see after a big natural disturbance such as a fire, we are effectively putting our eggs in many different silvicultural baskets and thereby effectively looking at uh, spreading our risk across the landscape in the face of climate change. One of the things certainly that we've seen in the East Gippsland fires this past or last in the last fire season um, and that we saw in 2009 with the Black Saturday fires is the importance of topographic refugia. So there are areas that are microclimatically or topographically less likely to burn historically. And, um, you know, those are areas that are probably worth putting a fair bit of effort into trying to protect, uh, whether that is physically through firefighting and uh, um, sort of logistical uh, at, uh, approaches to doing that, uh, whether that's trying to put uh, more fires and species in the neighborhood, or whether that is, you know, trying to make the forests around them more resistant to the fire by getting the trees to be bigger more quickly. So this is my gratuitous animal picture. So this is a leadbeater's possum that was uh, captured by one of our students, Jeremy Johnson, in camera traps in one of the retention sites in the Tandor Bren Silvicultural Systems trial. The interesting thing here was we found leadbeater's possum in every single one of the treatment sites. The only place that we didn't find leadbeater's possum was in the control sites, the 1939 regrowth that had had no, uh, no silvicultural uh, treatments at all. So I'll wrap up here. I just want to make a, a couple of points uh, about the broader issue of, of thinking about the forests in the future. Climate, as I've said, is going to shape these forests. And that climate change is baked into the system and it's going to continue for decades, if not a century or more. And we need to think about that very, very carefully. And one way that we can address this threat is to reduce the density of overcrowded forests. And we have a lot of them in our landscapes and we need to be thinking very carefully about whether we wanna leave them as overcrowded forests in the landscape and uh, suffer the consequences or whether we want to uh, be more proactive and make them more resilient to some of these climate threats. We also need to be thinking about natural disturbances as analogs. We've talked about this for decades, but I don't think we've had the data or the wherewithal to really understand very carefully what a natural disturbance looks like, in particular in terms of the heterogeneity of natural disturbances on the landscapes. And that's an important thing we need to have going forward because if we can spread the variability in stand composition and structure, we will be spreading the risk of these long-term impacts from climate across the broader landscape. And it'll also provide us with, in effect, an experiment where we try many different things and we learn the lessons from them, so adaptive, uh, effectively adaptive civil culture for climate change. So I'll return to those three points that I made at the beginning of the talk. Climate change is impacting our forests. Forest management can buffer these impacts, but not forest management as we know it. We really need to rethink how we manage our native forest estate in order to help get it through what is going to be a very tough next century. I'd like to just close by thanking uh, a, a number of uh, people and institutions, the Royal Society, of course, for, uh, for the invitation, the Australian Research Council uh, for continued support over much of the past decade, 
colleagues and collaborators, past and present, from Melbourne University, DELP, ARI, Vic Forests, Degster, DJPR, the University of New South Wales, and uh, Monash University, where I was before moving to the University of Melbourne. And uh, I would like to thank everybody in my research group, Craig Nitschke, Sabina Kessel, Kathy Allen, Raphael Truve, Katie Hammond, Ben Wagner, Anu Singh, Jeremy Johnson, and Harry Barton for all of uh, the remarkable work that uh, we've been able to achieve over, over the past decade or so. Forest management has a role, and I think it has an important role in, uh, in the native forest estate in the context of climate change. But, and I respect that there are many views about forest management, and that is based on uh, you know, 50, uh, 50 or more years of certain types of forest management. Um, I think we really need to, to have uh, a, a nuanced debate about what is the role of forest management and what pieces of our forest management toolkit we can use to positive effect in these forests. Because I think doing nothing in the face of rapid climate change is going to lead to many, many more problems.